Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Scandinavia House. I'm Lynn Carter, Executive Vice President of the American Scandinavian Foundation, and pleased to have you all here for our program, Just a Tiny Piece of Freedom, presented by ICORN, which is the International Cities of Refuge Network and based in Stavanger, Norway. And this program is also being presented in collaboration with the Penn American Center. For those of you who are, it's your first time here and you're new to Scandinavia House, just check out some, when you have a chance, other things we're doing. You can pick up our little brochure here of programs this season, or you can look on our website, scandinaviahouse.org, to see what's going on. Um, we have lectures, films, concerts, mu music, uh, children's programs, all sorts of things, and, and an exhibition on the sagas of Iceland right now. Uh, the program's going to start in just a minute with a short video about ICORN. And then Helga Lund, who is the executive director of the organization, will, take, will come to the stage and tell you more about the rest of the program. So thank you very much for coming. And please, after the entire program, you can join us outside there for a glass of wine. and the European Culture Project Shahzad Stories for Life. First of all, I will thank the Scandinavia House for a fantastic support and for being uh, taking part in planning and implementing this event. It has been a great joy for us to work with you here, and we are, do hope that we'll be able to come back to you and, and, and do other events here. It's, it's been uh, your generosity and hospitality has been fantastic, and, and professionality and everything, so we really like to be back with you, thanks a lot to Scandinavia House. Thanks a lot also to Pan American Center, a partner in the past and present, and hopefully also a lot in the future. A very good partner for ICON, and we do look forward to working with you, Pan American Center, also in the future. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, we will start with uh, first a speech and then with a with a conversation. And I'm very happy now, first of all, to introduce distinguished writer Anna Funder, who has been, um, who is, she's the writer of two remarkable and uh, richly awarded books, the first, Stasiland, and the second one, the novel, All That I Am. I'm very humble and, and glad that Anna has uh, taken interest in Icon's work. We met in June in Norwich at the, at the, at the festival, and we have started to, to talk about, to cooperate, with the, to, to m develop the organization further. And Anna will, uh, will um, hopefully and, uh, work with us in the future, for instance, on uh, Australia and Australian cities. And, and we are really, really glad that you are here. And I, it's my great pleasure to give the, word, give the floor to you. Please, Anna Fender. Thank you, Helga. I understand that tonight we're competing with a presidential debate, so we're going to forgive all the people who didn't make it here tonight because of that reason. It's a very great honour for me to be here tonight addressing you. I can think of no more important work than that of the writers in this room and of the organisations ICORN and PEN which support them. When I learned that I was going to speak here tonight with you, gee, I was humbled and I was thrilled, but I was also troubled. <clears throat> and when I examined why I was troubled, it was because of something that happened to me several years ago at a writers' festival in Britain. I was at dinner with other writers, and a large, bearded British academic sat next to me, tucked his napkin into his collar, rolled up his sleeves, um, and then proceeded to dismember a crab with his bare hands, all the while telling a story from my book right in front of me. Um, it was a story of a man that I had known and his efforts to escape the tentacles of the Stasi. I listened with interest, which grew to alarm and then disbelief. He was telling my story as if it was his own, and he was doing it right in front of me. I lost control momentarily of my lower jaw. I waited for him to acknowledge that that story was in fact mine. 
This feeling of having an imposter tell your story is what worried me when I was going to be speaking here tonight with you, Chi, and with you all. I do not wish to be the bibbed fool, making so bold as to tell stories that are yours. <clears throat> when I raised my, this fear with the kind people at ICORN, begging them, could I please maybe just go last? They said, no, you need to go first. And then I realized that this is perfect because I am here first in the way that a warm-up act comes on first at a rock concert before the real thing. I am the author of two books, for neither of which have I suffered in any way, unless one counts the minor but interesting irritation of being sued by a group of former East German Stasi agents. <clears throat> My first book, Stasiland, is a non-fiction account of four people who had the extraordinary courage to resist the East German communist regime and what happened to them for this brave exercise of conscience. It's also about some former Stasi men with whom I spoke in the 1990s and how they were coming to terms with the end of their world. My recent novel, All That I Am, is based on real people and real events. Thank you very much. It's about four very early, very brave anti-Hitler activists, um, one of whom I knew, who were forced to flee from Germany in January 1933, as soon as Hitler came to power. They were two couples, writers and excuse me, journalists, and they found themselves in exile in London. One would have thought that they were safe there from the Nazi regime, but that was not the case. The novel looks very closely at fear and courage, at love between men and women, and love of country. It looks at the difficulties for a writer of life in exile, which is to say that it looks at the price of being saved. And All That I Am examines the kinds of bargains that brave, outspoken people make with their lives. I'm frequently asked, why is it that I'm interested in these stories of resistance to dictatorship? I'm asked this question as if my interest were arcane, small and peculiar and marginal to the rest of the public. But this is not so. To my mind, we need to honour those who speak out against injustice for two main reasons. Of course, a plethora of reasons. But uh, I've spent some years trying to distill it down to two. First, because they show us what it is to be human at its best, the courage to act according to one's conscience. And second, because it's the courageous efforts of these people which may protect us from the anti-democratic impulses that exist in every society. An individual's courage to exercise her conscience, her dissent, can be the price of freedom for us all. I'm going to speak briefly tonight about such extraordinary courage and about why international organisations are crucial to people who exercise it. In 2006, I was asked by a Norwegian magazine if I would write a column for them. I was busy, I'd never heard of them. They wanted me to write about Eastern Europe. I said, well, why don't you try Anna Polakovskaya? So they did. They contacted her in Moscow, and she said she would write to them, at which second I then begged them to have me back. So um, Anna and I wrote alter alternating uh, columns for NITID, it was called, for a year or so, until she was murdered in October 2006 in the foyer of her apartment building in Moscow. <clears throat> I have Anna's courage in mind as I speak today, and that of others who have been killed, imprisoned, tortured, held under house arrest, forced into exile, or otherwise persecuted for speaking out. UG is a Christian. G.K. Chesterton defined, also a Christian, defined courage this way. Courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. Individual courage, this is my residual international constitutional lawyer coming out, you forgive me, it's just two paragraphs. Individual courage is necessary for the existence of a democracy because as Lord Acton famously had it, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolute power is power unchecked, unchecked by a free press and the separation of executive government, the legislature and the judiciary. These disparate protective elements are always shifting in relation to one another. 
in a society. They're either gaining or losing ground. The press might be in bed with the government and the police, as my countryman Mr Murdoch was, or as it is in regimes of tight censorship. The legislature might be beholden to unseen commercial interests or be pawns of executive government. The judiciary might be handed its verdicts by the government, as it was in East Germany, or in this country might be pandering in ways I don't yet understand to a sometimes bloodthirsty electorate. But in good times and places, these elements might just be held in a fortunate constellation that operates to guarantee basic freedoms. Whatever that particular situation, it's important to remember that this environment of democracy has laws as firm as Newton's. Just as gravity makes things come down, power sucks more of itself to itself. It centralizes control like a magnet pulling iron filings from every direction. In order to do this without protest, power must stifle dissent. I've spent many years examining this phenomenon, what I call the iron filing maneuver on the one hand and the courage and conscience of dissenters on the other. In all that I am, as I said, I was looking at very early, very brave resistors to the Nazi regime who have now been utterly forgotten by history. Dora Fabian was a brilliant economist, feminist and journalist who worked with the famous playwright Ernst Toller. Hans Wiesemann was a glamorous man about town in Berlin who wrote spoofs of Hitler that suddenly became life-threatening. Along with Hans's wife Ruth, the four of them found refuge in London. There, they suffered death threats in letters, house searches where nothing was taken. They were followed on the street. In March 1935, two of them were found poisoned in bed in the locked room of their top floor flat in Bloomsbury. One fully dressed but without shoes, the other in pajamas. The covers had been pulled neatly up to their chins. These methods of persecution are neither old nor new. They are always current. I was recently in a Nordic country where I spoke with an icon writer from the Middle East. He told me that the regime he is fleeing is sending him vicious threats via Facebook. When I started working on my novel, I was researching in London, and that was the time that Alexander Litvinenko was assassinated, rather flamboyantly, I thought by Russian operatives with a rare isotope of polonium infused into his Japanese tea. These methods vary from high-tech nuclear gruesome through to the internet to old-fashioned anonymous death threats in an envelope. But the aim remains the same, to frighten people who seek justice into silence, whether they are in your country or even if they have left it. Which brings me to the importance of international organizations that can help. In the week that the Nazis took power in Germany, they ransacked Ernst Toller. This is the real man. He's also my character, but I'm talking about the real man tonight. They ransacked his apartment, looking to take him into custody and to confiscate his works. Fortunately for him, he was abroad at that time. So unlike others of his writing friends, he remained free. In May 1933, after the Nazis had burned his books, there was an international pen congress in Dubrovnik. Toller, exiled in London, wanted to address the congress, but German pen had already expelled him because it had been cleansed and reconstituted with only right-wing writers. He would not be able to attend as part of his own country's pen delegation. The speed in Germany of the iron filing maneuver, the speed with which the National Socialists centralized power to themselves, eviscerating the autonomy of the states, ridiculing intellectuals, controlling universities, publishers, newspapers, the professions, organizations like Penn, and with slightly more of a struggle, the churches and the military, is astonishing even now. The government made cowards of everyone, almost. Civil society fell in a matter of months. But British Penn came to Toller's rescue. H.G. Wells insisted that he come along with them and speak as part of their delegation. And so he did, to great acclaim. 
It's one of the formidable advantages of international organizations like PEN and ICORN, that they can operate separately of the individual nations in which they're based, and so offer a real supranational support to writers speaking out against oppressive regimes. And now, just a couple of words about the courage required to do that. In his speech at Dubrovnik, Toller wanted the world to know that not all Germans were Nazi Germans. He wanted to incite his people, both within Germany and in exile, to courage. He knew that this meant facing down their own fear. This is what he said. Fear, he was an incredibly charismatic man, so I apologize to him posthumously for what I'm doing to his words. Fear, he said, is the psychological foundation of dictatorship. The dictator knows only that the man who has overcome fear lives beyond his power and is his sole dangerous enemy. Then Toller went on to say something that puzzled me for many years. He said, for whoever has conquered fear has conquered death. I think only now am I starting to understand this. Toller doesn't mean literally conquering death. He means that if you are not afraid to bring on your own death, and he wasn't, and Anna wasn't, the dictator holds nothing over you. You have conquered death in the sense that you have taken away their power to bargain with you for your life. In Anna Polakovskaya's words, you have decided that the price doesn't matter. Or in Chesterton's, the strong desire to live is somehow sitting side by side in your heart with the readiness to die. I think in terms of story and narrative, I'd like to share with you a story that helped me find a way to think about courage like Yuji's or Anna's or Toller's or the other people in my books. This story has helped me understand how courage is connected both to one's own personal sense of decency and also to the defense of the conditions required for the continuing well-being of the society around us. The Crow were a nomadic people in the Western USA who existed by hunting buffalo. As nomads, they had to move to fresh hunting grounds every season, and every time they did, they had to defend that territory that was vital for the maintenance of their community from other tribes. The last great Crow leader was a man called Plenty Coups, C-O-U-P-S. His name was an honor bestowed for his courage for pulling off the coups that were crucial to his people. The Crow protected the boundary of their lands with something called a coup stick. In a battle with their enemy, the Sioux, a warrior would carry his coup stick and plant it in, on the ground. That was the signal to the enemy of the point which he must not pass. It was the point which that crow warrior would defend to the death. Jonathan Lear, who's written about the crow, says this was a paradigm of courage. These were men who evidently were willing to risk their lives to protect the tribe. But not only this, this is Lear again. In planting the coup stick, the crow warrior was also in effect saying, there is a fate worse than death. Namely, it is better for me to die than for the Crow tribe to be threatened by the penetration of the boundary at this point. When I read this, it struck me like a bolt. Plenty Coup planted his stick because his sense of himself as a decent human being depended on it and because the survival of his society depended on it. Anna Politkovskaya and Ernst Toller and UG speak out because if they were silent, they would no longer be recognizable to themselves as moral beings. And they and others like them show us that there is a point beyond which the exercise of power is illegitimate. There is a point at which it threatens our human dignity and decency, and therefore our group, which relies on that dignity and decency to flourish. In conclusion, I'd like to say a word in this context about writing. If scientists can have, as they do, light as both particle and wave, I think we writers must be able to have writing as both illumination and weapon, as both light and saber. Writers need to speak the truth as we see it with the best words. Orwell had it that spin covers the truth like a layer of snow, like an octopus squirting ink. But it is also that words 
are our tools. When people legitimately seeking asylum are criminalised as terrorists, as they are in my home country, or racist mass murder is called ethnic cleansing, or civilian deaths in war are collateral damage, it is our tools that have been stolen and blunted. A writer's job is to use the sharpest tools to say the emperor has no clothes, or the government is holding my friend hostage, or I am afraid. You don't have to be a writer to speak the truth as you see it, but you can't be a good one without doing so. It's not, in the first instance, the painters or engineers or bakers who are locked up or killed in China or Russia or Syria or the Third Reich. It is the writers. It is the writers with their very sharp tools who plant the stake first. Oh, and finally, about my large, bibbed academic friend, when he'd finished speaking at the dinner, I cleared my throat. I said, I'm glad you think that story is important. I do too. I don't even think he remembered where he got the story from. But I meant it. These fates are individual, but the stories are vital for all of us. And now, my friends, for the real deal. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Funder. It was really food for thought, and uh, we really want to follow your writing and to work with you in the future. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to introduce the next speaker, or next guest, the recipient of the 2012 Civil Courage Prize, Mr. Yu Jie. We are very glad that you are with us tonight, and we're looking forward to listening, you, listening to you indeed. It's a Pan American Center, and it's uh, the director of the Freedom to Write program of Pan American Center, Larry Seams, who will lead the talk. And, and uh, I'll leave the floor. I'm very glad to leave the floor to Larry Seams and to you, Dio, and the interpreter. Please. Thank you so much, Helga. Thank you all for coming. Um, just a real personal and uh, an organizational note of thanks to 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 Icorn for the amazing work that they do. I, you know, um, Sarah and Deji and I are here, and you know, our phone will ring and we'll get a call from we don't know where in the world. And when that call comes from some play, somebody who really is, as they say in the movie, somebody who's locked in a room somewhere, and there are people who are banging on the door. There's really only one place to call, and that's ICORN. And they, I have seen this organization literally lift people out of a country and take them to a safe place to live, and it's really amazing. So it's an honor to be with you, and I really appreciate the invitation. And then it's even more of an honor to, being, to be able to sit next to this man who's a personal hero of mine. I'll introduce him. Uh, I should introduce first J.P. Lee. Lee, who's going to do the translation generously, um, offered to do that tonight. And uh, so I'd like to have everybody give him a hand before we even start. <laughs> because he has the hardest job of all of us. Um, and I'm just going to introduce UJ really br briefly, and then we're going to talk for about 20 minutes. And then we'll turn it over to the, the uh, longer film that'll give you more of an idea of what an incredible organization ICORN is. Um, Yuja is an essayist and critic whose 35 books have managed to raise the ire of the Chinese government over and over again. He was born in Chengdu in Sichuan province in 1973 and went to Beijing to attend Beijing University and study Chinese literature. Not long after he graduated, he wrote a, his first book, which is a collection of essays called Fire and Ice. Uh, it was published when he was in his mid-20s and became a major sensation until it was banned and removed from bookstore shelves. One of the people who read that book was Lu Jia. She's the wife of Lu Jia Bo. At the time, Lu Jia Bo was serving one of his previous prison sentences, a four-year sentence of re-education through labor. 
Luja brought him the book in prison, and that began a lifelong friendship that continues in spite the incredible circumstances of Luja and Luja Bo's uh, current situation to this day. Uh, from 2003 to 2007, Yu Jie served as vice president of our incredibly courageous independent Chinese pen center, while Lu Xiaobo served as the president. And when Lu Xiaobo and a group of writers crafted Charter 08 in 2008, uh, Yu Jie was one of the original signatories. That was released on the eve of Human Rights Day in 2008. Uh, Immediately before its release, of course, Lu Xiaobo was arrested. And then, like almost all of the original signatories, Yu Jia came under increased pressure after that arrest. It didn't stop him from writing. Uh, he wrote a book uh, which uh, created another sensation inside and outside of China called China's Best Actor, Wen Jiaobao, uh, about the Chinese prime minister. It was published in Hong Kong in 2010. When that happened, he was detained and placed under house arrest. For a month, he got out, he kept going again. He started conducting interviews for a biography about Lu Xiaobo. When the Nobel Committee announced in October in 2010 that Lu Xiaobo was going to receive that year's Nobel Peace Prize, he was again placed under house arrest, told not to finish the book. And then in December, the day before the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony in Oslo, Yu Jie was kidnapped and tortured, even losing consciousness at one point and coming close to death. During his beating, an officer told him, if an order comes from above, we can dig a pit to bury you alive in half an hour, and no one on earth would know. After he was released, he was, lived under increased surveillance until in January 2012, he fled to the United States with his family. He now lives in Virginia. His biography of Lu Xiaobo, which he was warned not to write, was released this past July in Hong Kong. He, he, heard, he was, as you heard, the recipient of this, the 2012 Civil Courage Prize this past week here in New York. He now lives in Virginia with his wife, Maggie, and their son, Justin. It's my great honor to welcome you, John. Since the subject tonight really is writing and exile, I thought I would, although we could talk for hours, I thought I would really confine my questions to you know, the, the, the sort of relationship that writers have with their audiences inside their country and outside of their country and what exile means for writers. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your early success, in particular the book Fire and Ice. Talk a little bit about that book. What made it so popular and what made it so controversial?呃中国的大学每个学生每个学生的宿舍里面都有一本因为是在在一九八九年以后到我我出版这本书的时候一九九八年差不多十年时间中国没有作家敢于说中国的真实情况而那个时候恰好是遇到了美国总统那克林顿
勇敢的人，所以他就问我，他说：“他说爸爸，你每天在电脑前面，然后那写作，你没有像一个消防员一样去救火，你为什么是一个勇敢的人？为什么会给你这个奖？” Um, my first book was successful. Um, also, it was because uh, it it was actually the first book to speak the truth after the uh, after 1989. And uh, um, actually, last week when I received the uh, Silver Courage Award in New York, uh, my son actually asked me a very interesting question. His um, his his four and a half month. Uh, he's four years now, actually, four and a half. So he asked me, uh, uh, because actually he had a good friend whose father was a fire, you know, fireman, fire, you know, firefighter. So he asked me why, um, why would you uh, be able to receive this award? You didn't do anything um, particularly <laughs> courageous, right? You, you're writing in front of your computer all the time. So why why it should be you not uh, not you know, firefighters? I don't know. I have to wait until he grows up so I can tell him all my failures. Because of the writing, the criticism of the Chinese Communist Party, I was arrested by those secret police officers. They arrested me to Beijing Jail, and they took my clothes and took me to jail. They took me to jail and took me to jail. They took me to jail. 一个酷刑是他们把我的手，然后，然后卡在前面，他们一个手指一个手指的撇我的手指，说：“你的，你的这两只手，在电脑前那写出了一千万字，然后，嗯，对那个共产党的妨害，就像一支军队一样，所以我们要把你的每一根那手指全部撇断。” Uh, I don't know when I will be able to tell my, my, uh, my son about my experience. Um, two years ago, uh, I was kidnapped by the, uh, the Chinese police, and I was taken to, a, um, to, the, uh, to the suburb of Beijing, and I was beaten, um, and I lost my consciousness. And they, uh, they even um, put my finger and uh, told me that uh, you have written more than um, one million words uh, against the government. So, uh, and, uh, so your fingers have done more harm than an army, army, so we could uh, punish you um, whatever we, we want to. I want to talk about the period just between the first book and that moment. And that was a, about a 10-year period during which you wrote 30, more than 30 books. And every time I read that, I, I can't figure out how this works. You, you were a blacklisted writer. You, you couldn't publish in China. So how did those 30 books get published, and who read them? So, after 1985 published in Hong Kong instead of the mainland. And uh, I, I, I haven't been able to publish in the mainland since 2005. So I'm very um, grateful that uh, there's a place called Hong Kong, you know, that allows me to publish and write. So, as a writer, I want to to 那作家哈金，他的一本书《那自由生活》，他写到有很多流亡到那西方的呃，那中国作家，他们以为在一个自由的世界里面可以自由的写作，但是他们以为自己像一只小鸟一样在天上飞，实际上他们像一个风筝一样，他们的这个风筝的线还被那共产党那个抓在手里，所以他们还是没有自由，他们的心里没有自由。Um, as a writer, I wanted to uh, to live freely and write freely, which was why I left China and uh, came to the United States. But um, you know, a lot of people 
think that uh, living in the United States, you, you can uh, write and think and live freely. But uh, it's actually not always the case. A lot of writers, um, when they come to the United States, they still, um, in terms of their thinking, they still cannot uh, think freely, unfortunately. We'll come back to that because that's a really interesting point. But uh, I'm interested, that, so these books were published in Hong Kong. Were they read inside of China? Did people smuggle copies in? Were there versions that were published on the internet? Did your friends read them? I mean, how many, and I'm thinking of the idea of exile and being in a strange country, but isn't this a kind of exile in your own country where you, you're writing but you don't even have the ability to reach an audience that lives right across the street from you?但实际上因为进入互联网时代以后通过互联网仍然能够突破这样一种那封锁我举一个例子我写我们家宝的那部书后来德国之声这是德国之声的那个中文的那广播他们把我这本书制作成一个一个朗读版然后可以在网站上那
in in in, in Sichuan, and uh, uh, I had to leave. Be I, I was forced to leave Beijing also uh, in var various places. So and my uh, my uh, my wife had to stay in Beijing. So at that point, the three of us, you know, our whole family was broken up into three parts. So they uh, so they, uh, they didn't allow me to, uh, to make phone calls or to use uh, so, uh, the internet. So for a couple of months, I, I lost um, uh, any connection to the outside world. Um, I wonder, is, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this question will make sense, but do you remember when the first time in your life you thought, maybe this isn't worth it, maybe I'd like to go live somewhere else? When was the first time you actually imagined the possibility that you would end up in exile? Mm. So Ma so uh, since 2003, I have uh, made frequent visits. You, you, uh, you should stay here. You should not go back to China. But I always told my friends that as long as my life is not so threatened, I, I would uh, stay in China. I, I would not want to leave. So the time that uh, I uh, made my mind was uh, 2010, when I was kidnapped by uh, the police. Uh, so I, I, I was beaten, uh, and I was on the brink of death and uh, so the first uh, hospital I went to uh, the uh, the hospital told told my wife that they, uh, they there was no way they could save my life and uh, so I went to so my wife took me to the second hospital and uh, I was uh, barely um, you know so I, I was saved but my uh, life was severely threatened so back then at that time I decided that I could not stay in China any longer. And just how did you get from China to Virginia? How did that process work? Mm. 然后有超过一年的时间后来我说我如果你们不让我 so um, I uh, so I at, at first I told the police that I would you know I would leave China and they didn't and they uh, they said no so it was a long uh, process of negotiation so uh, until uh, not until um, about a year later I was finally uh, allowed to to leave China but before that um, I um, you know to so, so I, I told the police that if you do not allow me to leave China, I have to follow um, uh, my uh, friend, uh, another uh, Chinese writer called Liao Yiwu, who, uh, f who fled China um, 
through another uh, channel, he um, he kind of secretly uh, fled China and he went to v Vietnam first, which was a long and uh, tedious process. I, so I told the police that if you don't allow me to leave China legally, I will do something, and which would not be uh, good for your um, publicity. Tamanji 在香港成立一个一个假的出版社，给我签一个出版合同，他们出了很多钱，把我的这本书的版权买下来，但他们不会出版这本书。但是又被我拒绝以后，那第三次他们给我发出版的话说，不要以为你到美国就很自由、很安
I think we could talk for much longer, but I know we have a film, so I think we'll leave it at that. Um, please join us for wine afterwards and have a chance to, to speak to you yourselves while we have him among us. He goes back to Washington tomorrow. And please join me, first of all, in thanking JP again for, <clears throat> I don't know how you do that. And then you, Jeff. briefly introduce the film that we're going to see. But first I have to extend a very big thanks to Anna Funder and also Yuji for being here, for sharing their time and their stories and their perspectives with us tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you to Larry and JP for uh, facilitating that. The Sharasad Stories for Life project is about just that, about the sharing of stories of views and perspectives from around the world, and ultimately about the freedom and the right to do so. For five years, six of the ICORN member cities have, with the support of the EU Culture Programme, organized hundreds of events highlighting these issues and promoting the ICORN network and the stories told and written by the guest writers hosted by the ICORN cities. Tonight's documentary is one of the re results of this collaboration. Silence or Exile was co-funded by ICORN, the Charissade Project, and the Norwegian Free Word Foundation. The French director, Marion Stalins, has made a film where four exiled writers, three of which have been hosted by ICORN, tell their stories. We hope you'll find them as interesting and moving as we do. And I also have to say, though it's been said already, that as this is, in fact, the American premiere of Silence or Exile, we would like to invite you all to join us for a small reception afterwards here at Scandinavia House. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the film. <laughs>